Good afternoon, this is Lucas from Wilger Industries here in Saskatoon. Uh, just to walk you through the electronic flow monitoring setup app for the Android system. So we'll start off here. Before we get into the app itself, well, we'll go into the Tip Wizard app, which has provided us for spray tip calculators and as well as visual flow indicators and such. What we'll do in there is go into the flow indicator tab, select our application units, put in our example speed, which let's say we'll, we're applying five gallons an acre, average speed at around five miles an hour, nozzle spacing at 12 inch spacing, again, given this example, we'll be on an air drill, as well as the weight of liquid. So being 10.67 uh, pounds per gallon, which would be around that 2800 uh, weight. And for the number of outlets per flow column, we typically use one flow indicator per outlet, just giving the, the best accuracy. So. We'll search and what we're focusing on is the electronic flow meter. Given the flow meter's capacity for, for monitoring flow, there are four jets that can be swapped out just to give better accuracy within those flow ranges. So in our example, we put in our application unit and rate and all, and all that. The application rate turns out to be 0 0.057 gallons per minute, to which we'd be using that green jet to give us the peak accuracy for that application. So now that we know that, we can actually put it on our liquid kit itself. So we'll go into the Wilger Flow Monitoring System app. We'll allow that. Uh, depending on the version of the app, the main screen might be a little different or whatnot, but again, typically the, the settings are gonna be very similar or the same. First thing we'll do is go into the ECU setting. At the very top button, you'll see that. A little pop-up will show up asking for a default pin the default pin is 1111. You can change it if needed, and we'll hit accept. And from this screen, we'll change it to actually reflect our system itself. So let's say on our, our example, we're on a 16 row air drill. So again, a very small implement. But with those 16 rows, we only have one node. So one 16 channel node being used. So we'll change it to one node. The nodes themselves are the little black boxes that are connected to the ECU by extension harnesses or whatnot. Um, so typically each would run up to 16 channels or, or sensors and you wouldn't have a ton of them typically. So we'll put in one node just for our example for the ECU serial number. So that's the, the serial number that's on the back of the ECU. The ECU being the, the little box with the antenna sticking out of it that your main power supply is going into. In our example it's 112-4674. Yours will be similar in that it is seven digits. In case you have any questions with Wi-Fi channels or interference with other Wi-Fi signals on the implement as well, the last digit in the serial number is the Wi-Fi channel that it's transmitting on. So in our case, it'd be four. Again, for most of you, you don't have to worry about that, but just in case, you'll know ahead of time. For the view layout, there's two options, a single product view and a multi-product view. Multi-product view allows you to, to apply or, or show it on 10 different sections. Again, much better for larger equipment, for much larger roles and that kind of stuff. For our example, we only need single product view. So that's going to show 72 runs per page. If you click on that, a little disclaimer will come up just to let you know if you previously put in any sections past section 4 to 10, those sensors are not going to be counted, if that makes sense, because they're off screen. So we'll accept that. For the diagnostic history, we will leave that at 120. That's nothing you'll need to change. For page scroll cycle, for us, we don't need it. So we'll leave it off or zero. If you had multiple screens being tabbed through, you can set that for however many seconds you'd like for it to, to swap to. Uh, for application rate unit, we'll change that to US gallons per minute. That's what we're comfortable with. And application uh, rate unit would be the US gallons an acre. For application speed, for our example, we're applying at five mile an hour. And often, if you ever get into the app where you cannot see the next options due to the keyboard or whatnot, you just hit the back button and minimizes that. In our example, we're on 12 inch spacing. So we'll change 16 inches to 12. The next option being the alarm percent threat or plus or minus. So that's that threshold of the alarm. So anything outside of in this case 20%, would have the ball turn yellow just so that you're signifying uh, that there's an issue. For our example, we can turn it down to 15% just by preference. 
You can always change that on the go as well. So it doesn't change anything as far as the operational capabilities. And for the jet selection, since we've previously determined that the green jet is what we should be using on our liquid kit, uh, we will select green jet. There is a means to do a manual calibration as well, just in case you want to fine tune it to your specific application and specific gravity and, and such like that. For products two and products three, since we're not using them, we can ignore them. They're not going to impede anything. They're just there for, for applications that will need those two and three. So that's the, the main ECU setup screen. The next screen we'd be going to is the wrench. So that would be the sensor setup screen. From top to bottom, showing it, we'd have one, two, and three. So each of those sections is a line of, of balls, if that makes sense, or, or sensors, sensor rows. Uh, right below that is product one, product two, product three. Each product has their own section one, two, three, if that makes sense. So with that, in our example, we're only needing 16 rows of a single product. So all of our sensor information will be set up on the same page. Um, you can leave rows blank. So wherever you see NA under the node, that row is not being used. So it'll ignore it. So you can always leave spaces. It doesn't hinder the app working whatsoever. And beside the products, you'll see labels. So again, default zero being the first one that you can change to whatever the product is. So for an example, well, we'll call it, we'll call this starter or whatever it actually is, except that's just a label. And then what we'll do on our sensor screen. So these rows, uh, the very far left, that's our label for that row. So in our case, we're just doing one. We can hit next, two, three, and we'll just do this all the way up to our last run. So eight, and then switch over to the next side, nine. So the reason I'm doing this labeling ahead of time is just to simplify it, because we know how many rows are on the, the planter or the drill. So now we have an idea of, of how it's going to be laid out on the screen. After that, press back. We'll change the nodes. So the node, that's the, the physical node that that sensor is attached to. In our case, since we only have one node, it's going to be simple because they'll all be node one. So if we want, we can change those just to make it a little less tedious. And you'll notice pretty quick, as soon as we change it to 1A1, it goes red. And the reason for that is that if there's a duplicate entry of a sensor, so if we're calling on a sensor more than once, the app knows right away that, oh, something's wrong. Typically that wouldn't be done because it's just going to be duplicating the, the sensor feedback as well as how it's reporting. So what that means is there's duplicate information and you'll need to fix it just to make sure. If there's, for an example, an application where you change it to a sensor or a node and it goes yellow, that means that sensor does not exist or that node, sorry, does not exist in the entire system. So in our case, since we've only told the system that, yes, we're only using a single node, obviously node five doesn't exist. So it gives you kind of a, a quick diagnostic to check. So this is where the divider, being the sensor divider harness, and then the sensor itself, so being the quad sensor cable, like that has the one, two, three, and four molded into it. This is where you'd actually have to determine how it's laid out on the, on the drill. For simplicity, for our example, we're going to assume the first row of product. So the first actual row is using node one and on the quad sensor uh, divider coming out of the node, it's labeled A. So div being divider, A, and the first sensor would be one. And as it happens, we plug the next one in was one, A, two, being the, the second sensor on that quad sensor cable. The quad sensor cable comes out of the node harness and then splits through a little junction box with a little Wilger logo on it or whatnot with a bolt mount in it. And then it splits into four different sensor cables. Each of those sensor cables have a molded in number, whether it be one, two, three, or four. And that'll determine what label our, our role will be. In our example, we'll go one, two, three, four, because that's how it's actually laid out on the drill. 
and each divider only has a 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the next one, in our example, we would have used the harness B off of the node. So we can change the next 4 to B, because just as it happened, they were B1, 2, 3, 4. So B1, B2, B3, B4. And you'll notice pretty quick, the uh, red disappears as well. Continuing our example, we'll assume the next divider being used was C. So we can change those four. And again, as it happens, it just happened that we put it in nice and neat that the next four sensors were C1, C2, C3, C4. Notice pretty quick here that we will do the last ones which would be D, so 1D1, one 1D2, one, one 1D3, one 1D4. So what you'll notice pretty darn quick is that we have rows 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Oh, and we had a typo. So we have obviously missing a row. And simple enough, we'd check that. So in the case that we'd actually be missing. So let's go back and assume we miss that same row. There, and I'll change the numbers again, just for troubleshooting purposes. This is what would end up happening. As soon as the flow meter itself is connected to the ECU, you'll see rows of the balls down the length of the screen. With that, what's going to happen is that you'll see the row 16. And if you're actually on your implement, so on your air drill, and you turn off that row or the flow to that row, to row 16, and none of the balls have gone down on the application itself, then you know pretty confidently that you haven't put that sensor in, you haven't referenced it. To which you go into the sensor setup screen and just verify. So we'll correct this, we'll go 16. And now we'll plug in our ECU, the main screen showing that there is no connectivity to the ECU whatsoever will change. All right, so now that we've turned the ECU on, the app itself automatically connects to the, the ECU Wi-Fi. So how you can determine that, you see pretty darn quick in the, there we go, in the Wi-Fi settings, you'll see something like Wilger EFI underscore and then your serial number. So that means you're connected to it as far as issues that it will cause because the app itself has to authenticate the Wi-Fi connection to the ECU. It has to do it from within the app. So you'll never put in a password or anything like that. What ends up happening is that the ECU serial number acts as that password and the authentication to connect to that ECU. So. So what we'll see right now is we see our 16 balls. Since our ECU is on, but there's no flow, they're showing that they're alarming. Uh, without, well, I guess I can turn on the alarm here quick. We'll kind of hear kind of an annoying little buzz. You can mute it by using the, the tablet's volume keys for media. Also, you can leave it on. And if you tap the, the alarm, you can actually mute everything for five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour or an hour, just to give you an idea. So usually for turning situations and that kind of stuff, you have yourself covered. One other thing, if you click into the balls as they're applying, it'll bring up a little snapshot screen. So this is where you can see the flow rate in gallons per minute for each individual roll. So whereas the balls are nice for seeing a snapshot of how the balls are flowing, you know, relative to each other, that product snapshot will actually show you the actual flow rate in, in gallons per minute, just more accuracy. Also, just so you're aware, for the computation side of things, when, when a ball is green or when the ball is floating and not red, it's pulled into the average flow rate. So it, it's a cumulative rolling average of the flow rate. As soon as a ball is red, so where it's like zero or within 10% of the average flow or very, very low, uh, it starts getting excluded from the average just so that if one run is blocked off completely, you'll get alarmed, but the rest of them will become averaged at a higher flow rate. Um, yeah, but this is pretty much how it looks. So you have the three rows of up to 24 rows. For an example, if you did want to have it that 
your implement was split in half. So one half being, or one wing being a section and the other being another. You can actually, in the setting screen, you can actually leave a blank in between. Or you could even use start nine on this side and go down and such there as well. So that it's very customizable in the app itself. So you can do that. As far as things to do from here, once you actually get an application rate or, or flow going through, you'll see on the right here, you'll see your starter and you'll get an average application rate, total gallons per minute applied, an application rate, you know, US gallons per acre, as well as an accumulator. So if you ever have an application where it just seems the Wi-Fi signal does not connect to the ECU, so often what'll end up happening is, and you'll see the the original default lines um, or, or two brackets with a ball inside. As far as if that's happening to you in the field, you might get something like Wi-Fi interference where there's multiple bands of, of Wi-Fi signal being broadcast on the same channel. So for an example, if, if there was a system like Intelligent Egg for blockage sensors or, or some other Wi-Fi sensor, you might have it intermittently coming in and out for the Wi-Fi. But what ends up happening, they're, they're just fighting for, for that connectivity. So simply enough, if you're using a system that you can change that Wi-Fi channel, so like for some, they have their own access points that you can actually change it in the back end what it's transmitting on, uh, then great, do that. Alternatively, like I mentioned ahead of, or a little earlier, the ECU serial number, the last digit is that channel that is hard-coded that it's transmitting on. So it's, it's just a matter of pairing um, systems that are not transmitting on the same channel. If you have, for example, a home Wi-Fi network that is broadcasting internet that has been on that tablet before, often the case because the ECU isn't transmitting inter internet information, the tablet itself will kind of swap to the, the one that usually can provide internet. So it, while it won't make a difference in the field, because you won't have you know a wireless router in, in range, uh, you may have to go into the product setting or the, the Wi-Fi settings and forget that connection just while you get things sorted out and such like that. Um, in real field applications, you're not going to have that issue, but just when you're setting up, that might cause you some grief just getting it initially set up. If you ever have any questions or issues with the, the application, there's a manual. So if you press question mark, it'll load the manual in a PDF. You might have to enable your whatever PDF viewer you have on your tablet, to which you can definitely scroll down and, and check whatever you need to as, as far as uh, table contents and that kind of stuff there too.